Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with a harp. Make melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen is his own inheritance. The Lord seeks, looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He can do, considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, what an awesome God you are. What a glorious day you've blessed us with. And how privileged we are to meet here, to come before your awesome throne with boldness. We thank you, Father, for that throne of mercy, that throne of grace. It treats us less than our sins deserve because it's your gift. It cost you your son, however, and for that we're very sorry. When we see what was done to him, we realize the devastating power of sin. And it can convict us. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit who does that as well. To bring us to our senses and to convict us and to deliver us. Father, we pray you'll bless us this morning as we worship. May everything we do and say please you well. Bring a smile to your face and honor to your name. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. 908. Nine hundred eight. Sorry about that. Nine hundred eight. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. 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 He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. 676. 676. Six hundred seventy-six. 
There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers, wait, I know. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus wept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace, Resting neath the sheltering wing, always looking on you, smiling face. That's why I trout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the world. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my Longing keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall live with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. 419. Four hundred nineteen. Four hundred nineteen. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not us to disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on thee our souls depend, in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with thy rich grace, tune our lips to sing thy praise, tune our lips to sing thy praise. In thine own appointed way, now now we seek thee, here we stay. Lord, we know not how to go till a blessing thou bestow, till a blessing thou bestow. Grant that all may seek and find the God supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free. Let us all rejoice in thee. Let us all rejoice in thee. 59. 
Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit trusts for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Would you mark 50 in your books, please? 50. While you're turning there, it's my understanding that Ladies' Day will occur the 19th at Marinci, I believe. And so uh, you ladies are invited to go to that. Bree told me to make sure to announce that. Hopefully she'll be here this evening. And if I'm wrong, you know her. She's like her daddy. She'll correct me. <clears throat> And uh, so I'm glad to see all of you this morning. Glad you're here. Would you please turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. I had a former student that I really got along with and back got along with him so well that they came out during the harvest festival when I was principal at San Lorenzo one year and he turned around and he was gonna he used me as a guinea pig to take my blood pressure and all that stuff and and I told him I said well I'm glad you're doing that because I I'll tell you what my oxygen level's not where it needs to be. But the funny thing was, he told me, he says, now this time, Springer, you're going to do what I tell you to do. We all had a good laugh. And none of the kids got it. I said, I used to have him at the middle school and I'd tell him what to do. And sometimes I'd have to send him home. And we, we'd laugh about it now. But he, he would look at me and yesterday, for example, he looked at me and he said, Mr. Springer, how you doing? And I said, I'm doing all right. We visited a minute. And he said, well, how many years have you got left? Are you still teaching? And I said, yep. I said, if I want to, I can call it this year. And then he looked, he said, well, are you going to? I said, the way it's been this last two months, yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> I may not. I haven't made up my mind, but I've been praying about it a lot. I told the principal the same thing. I said, I've been praying about it a lot, but there's some things that have changed in my personal life that may force my hand. But nonetheless, we, uh, we're, we're doing trying to do what the Lord wants us to do. But the one thing that kids look at me and say, and people look at me and say is, you look tired. When I was growing up, the old timers used to tell me something like this. Dwayne, I was born tarred. I was raised tarred. And I'm going to die tarred. And I'd go, huh? And they'd go, you don't understand, but you're going to. Now I wish I could go back and tell those people who have died, yeah, I get your point. <laughs> Floyd used to tell me, and he never would take a nap when he was younger, but he says, you know, Dwayne, if I don't get my nap in, I get in a grouchy mood. I said, you must not have got a nap today. And he said, no, I didn't. <laughs> they had a couple of funerals at Terrazas. And you see a group of exhausted Christians 
you see a group of exhausted Christians who are the recipients of Peter's letter. Peter being not number two, even though that was the job he wanted, realized very quickly when he was indwelled with the Holy Spirit along with about 120 other people that he was just one of many. And when he writes this book, he knows that he's about to die. He puts it in a way that, that at first you don't understand. He, he talks about this tent. And what he's getting at is he's referring back to the tabernacle, which was portable. It was a tent. The temple is permanent. That's what we know today as the Lord's church. Not the building, but the Lord's church. And the Lord's church, whether we're a part of it or not, is going to be in heaven. Because it already is in heaven. You know from Philippians or Colossians chapter 3, or excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, that our conversation, the King James says, our citizenship is in heaven. It is not going to be, it already is. Thus, the prayer Jesus makes is very appropriate in Matthew chapter 6. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet, we sometimes get frustrated in this life. I was talking to the Lord this morning about this. There should be no reason that I am frustrated except for the fact that's what's happened to me. One of the things that I work on constantly is that I don't try to take things personally, but sometimes that gets to you when about 10, 20 people and your boss turns around and treats you the way she does. <laughs> I think she realized what she did the other day, as a matter of fact, but nonetheless, I kept telling Adele and the kids, I don't want to go back. I've got enough days that if I wanted to, I could get my doctor to sign off, not Doc Morris, but if he will, please. No, I'm just kidding, kidding. That I could take off the entire school year. The FTE for the district would go down. That's a funding thing. I'm not that important. That's not what I'm getting at. But there are days when I just sit and go, why even continue? Why did the Lord want us to stay on this earth? What was it the Lord had in mind whenever he created the church and he allowed an enemy who is very formidable, who can't be beaten without the Heavenly Father's help and now without Jesus' help, how in the world are we going to continue? How is it that we are going to continue in this life? Peter says, you need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. And he describes us, talking about Peter and us, in some incredible ways. First thing that he tells us is we're slaves. Now that doesn't sound very good knowing the history of slaves in our country. But I want to reassure you that 95% of the slaves in this country were treated well. Most of the slaves wanted to stay with their master because that's all they knew and they were treated well. It was the 5%. And still today, that principle that the smaller controls the bigger is still around. Because we got to, if you were like me, you got to watch the movie uh, with Kunta Kente. You got to watch the, the history of that. And, and you got to see the abuse of that. And when they cut off his feet just to keep him from running, and he still was running. Cruel. And I will tell you, one of the sad epitaphs in the church is the fact that we had separate congregations for blacks, Hispanics, and for whites. And for what reason? Because some denominational preacher back years ago said that blacks were the descendants of Ham and the curse placed on Ham by his father, uh, uh, good grief, Noah, <laughs> made them inferior to whites. I loved 
I love what the late Jack Evans said in a debate with him. And he's got to, and, and I, I didn't get the book. Leroy decided to give it to the, to another young preacher, but it was called the curing of ham. Where do we get such ridiculous ideas? The, the idea of slavery here is we're servants. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, that we are slaves to him. And brethren, let me remind you, there is no better master than the Lord. What did he say in that great invitation? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Work? No, rest. Take my yoke upon you. Come learn from me, for I, my yoke is hard. No, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And we've been made his servants. We've been made his slaves. That's what the Greek word doulos is. But we have such a great master. And what did Peter say? He's a servant. The subsequent translations of the New King James calls it bond servant. Same idea. We're slaves. And since we are slaves, he became an apostle and I'll put this in here because there are some people today, they're not doing it anymore much. But one particular fellow out in California, he called himself apostle. Let me tell you, the way you became an apostle was you had to be an eyewitness of Jesus' life, his death, and his burial, and his resurrection. And if you look at verses 16 through 18 in this chapter, what is it Peter said? I'm going to stir you up just like the Lord was on that mountain. Now, let me tell you something. I'm not going to listen to that guy. By the way, he's dead now. But I'm not going to listen to a guy call himself apostle. I don't care if a denomination names you an apostle. There was only 13, one of those being the apostle Paul. And the Bible sets that straight. You had to be an eyewitness. I'm not. Oh, I, I, I see it by faith in the scriptures. That's not what I said. But we are not eyewitnesses of him. But look at the title. Look at the privilege that Peter had. You remember it is Peter? And all four of the Gospels who said what? Oh, let me tell you something, Lord. How dare you say I'll deny you? How dare you say I'll deny you? I will never deny you. I'll not only not deny you, I'll do what? I'll die for you. You know the rest of the story. There he is. Somebody says, hey, you're a Galilean. You were with Jesus. Nope. I mean, somebody else came to him and said, Hey, I saw you with Jesus. Nope, that wasn't me. And a girl said, wait a minute. You're a Galilean and you were with Jesus and you were with that man and he began to cuss. And you'll recall what Jesus told him before the rooster crows in Mark's account, before the rooster crows twice. You'll deny me three times. And I'm partial to Luke, Luke 22, 71. See, I'm really partial because my mom and dad didn't have to give me the look very often. You know what look I'm talking about. They would just look at you and you better get the message quick. My aunt told the story of a little boy who was acting up in church. 
And finally, mom and dad had all they could take. Little boy was pretty smart. As the dad was taking him out to spank him, he screamed out in the middle of worship, y'all pray for me. Norma said, I felt so sorry for the kid. <laughs> said, at first I wanted him spanked, then I felt sorry for him. But what did Peter do? He denied the Lord. And yet what happened in John 21, he restored him. And Peter never forgot that, but he never, ever let that keep him from going forward. Because you see, number three, we have precious faith. Where did we get in our minds that the subject of faith is not that important? Oh, probably from the idea that it's an elementary discussion from Hebrews 6. Or we talk about it so much that we just take it for granted that we know what we're talking about. I had a guy sub for me one time in preaching. And I said, well, what'd you preach about? And he knew the old joke. He said about five minutes. I said, well, that's what people wanted anyway. And he, that didn't get him out of it. And I said, well, what'd you preach on? And he said, the pulpit. And I said, well, what'd you preach about? And he said, oh, you know, I just preached about faith. And I said, what does that mean? And he says, what do you, what? I said, what did you mean by, oh, it's just faith. Look, it is going to take faith for us to trust God, believe God, and obey God. And what is it that pleases God? Faith. Don't ever diminish faith. Don't ever say faith is not that important. Don't ever go, oh, faith. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to all of those who believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now look at verse 17, quotes from the book of Habakkuk 1, 17. The just by his faith shall live. There are things that make no sense to us yet if we trust and obey we will have eternal life now i know this is going to sound sacrilegious when i say this but let me give you an example baptism makes no sense to us oh i, I didn't say it wasn't a command I didn't say it wasn't something we, should, we shouldn't do. No, no, no. We need to be baptized in order to be saved. But why is it that we should get in a tank of water? Why is it we should go down in the water and be raised up from the water? Wait a minute. Doesn't make earthly sense, but it makes heavenly sense. Doesn't Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 tell us that? You know why God chose baptism? It is to show that we are dead to sin. We are buried with Christ. We are raised to walk in a newness of life. And so if we have that, we don't have it because we earned it. But we got grace. When you go back to Ephesians 2, that tells us what grace is. That's the gift of God. You go back to Genesis chapter 6. And let me stress this. When Moses is told by the Holy Spirit or inspired by the Holy Spirit to write, God was sorry he ever made man. I don't know how awful it was specifically, but it was sure awful enough that God was sorry he ever made man. But see, like Eddie Parrish said this morning on Brown Trail, God never ends a story with no hope. God was sorry he ever made 
man. But look at what the next verse says in Genesis 6. But Noah found. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace is always there. Grace was in the Old Testament. Grace is in the New. Grace is in the New Covenant today by which we live. And the Bible tells us that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And thank God he did. Things were so awful and so bad that only eight souls were saved. Only eight souls were saved. Somebody said the other day, doesn't this remind you of the days of Noah? I said, it always reminds me of the days of Noah. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Just as it was in the days of Noah. So it will be when the Son of Man comes. And we have grace. What else do we have? We have that precious faith that also leads us to peace. Peace. When I went down to Windmill, I hold a meeting down there. I got to be honest with you, I couldn't go to sleep for a while. I couldn't go to sleep for a while because it was so peaceful and quiet. I'm telling you, this town you, that I live in is the noisiest town in the United States. And I'm glad it is to a point because it means people are working People are trying to get to work. They're doing what they should do. I almost get run over every morning when I go to the bus yard, but hey, okay. Imagine what it is when you are a child of God. And you know it when you're a child of God. To be at peace with God. To be at peace with God. You don't want to be an enemy to God. In fact, that's what James says over in chapter one or chapter four. I'm sorry. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, is hatred with God? You don't want that. The Bible talks about in Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. But you know it will guard your hearts and minds. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he tells us to do something that we don't, that doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I know it makes heavenly sense, but it doesn't make any sense to us as far as humans. Be anxious for nothing. Now listen, Lord, you don't understand, as though the Lord didn't know anything, as though the Lord didn't understand anything. Lord, you didn't understand what that person did to me. Lord, you didn't understand that bill that came up. Lord, you didn't understand that car that broke down. Lord, you those are genuine things. That's not what I'm saying. But I will tell you, I tested this out on many occasions, but I tested it out on one occasion. One of the toughest times of my life. And I had people coming to me and going like, what is the matter with you? What do you mean? Man, I'll tell you what, if I were you, I think I'd have caught that guy in a dark alley. And I said, what for? My hand would hurt. Yeah, but wouldn't you feel better? No. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans 12, 21, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh, you're a Christian. Uh-huh. It's a good principle and a good life to live. Want to want, want to join us? Want to be a part of us? Oh, maybe one day. You see, one of the many reasons I obeyed the gospel is I got peace. And then Peter turns around and he says, let me tell you, God has given us some tools to live successfully. Now, look, they are, he hasn't given us everything, and I sure am glad he hasn't. He hasn't given us all the answers. We're at a Bible study one time, give you an example of what I'm talking about. And somebody said, well, what, what's a celestial body and what's a 
terrestrial body. I said, well, you're in your terrestrial body. Well, what's a celestial body look like? I said, I haven't got a clue. Well, you're the preacher. I know, but I still don't have a clue. I don't know what that body looks like. I've never seen it before. I just know we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Well, what's that look like? I don't know. But you're the preacher. I don't know. I love what a wise lady said at that Bible study. She says, Dwayne, aren't you glad there's some things we don't have to worry about? I said, amen, sis. There are things we don't have to worry about. He's got it all under control. But look at what he tells us in verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. To life and godlikeness. We need to live. The devil wants us to die. We need to live because God wants us to live. He did not create us to die. But because he punished us and we sin because of that, uh, sorry, he punished us because of our sin, we now live under the curse of death. But the beautiful thing is God doesn't end the story with no hope. He tells us, that about that second death you see death is not annihilation death is separation from god and we won't if we're children of god and remain faithful to him we won't be affected by the second death we'll be going home we'll be going home and whether you think it's cliche -ish or not Home sounds good, doesn't it? My grandma said words. I don't even know if she knew she said it. But she always said it when she didn't get to go home and she had hardening of the arteries to the brain. But her last words was, I want to go home. She's on her way. I look forward to arguing with the woman. I look forward to giving the woman a hug. I look forward to introducing her to you. You see, Peter continues, he says, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And he continues in what we call those Christian graces. I don't know who named it first, probably Wendell Winkler, but it fits. Add to your faith, moral courage, the moral courage, knowledge. And you continue down with those things. And he says, if you, if you have these things, you are right with God. But if you don't, you have myopic vision. You have, you're short-sighted and you need to have corrective lenses. I don't mean the ones I got in my eye. I don't mean the ones a lot of you are wearing. Bible means you need to have the correction of God. What is it? What does he mean by these exceedingly great and precious promises? Someone counted, and I don't even know if they're accurate, when they said 7,000 promises in the Bible. 7,000 promises. And God's faithful in every one of them. But 1 John 2.25 is one example. This is what he has promised us. Life? Nah. Eternal life. You see, we've escaped. We've escaped this fallen world. Somebody says, well, I'm still in it. No, that's not what I mean. <laughs> we've got somebody who helps us with this life. 
Romans 8, 37, we've been made more than conquerors through whom, through him who what? Loved us. First John 4, 19, we love him because we loved him first. I don't think so. We love him because he loved us first. And now we've become divine, a part of the divine nature. Jesus was counseling Nicodemus in the first five verses of John 3. And he says, we know you're a teacher come from God, Nicodemus said. No man can do the things you do except God be with him. And Jesus goes, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus didn't understand that. Initially, we didn't understand it either. But Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how does that happen? That happens in a baptistry. That happens being buried. That happens coming out of that water race to walk in newness of life. Baptism is not the end. And that's a myth that some Christians live by. Baptism is not the end. It's just the start. I still laugh at kids when they find out how long Adele and I have been married. Golly, you've been married 34 years. How old are you? Aren't you ancient? And I tell them, doesn't seem like 34 years. I can remember yesterday when dad was standing there and my little brother now, he stands six, four ways, 370. Floyd and Joanne and Rena and Todd and Carol all there and Bill's there. And you know what dawned on me the other day or dawned on me, not the other day, dawned on me a few minutes ago. You know, they're gone. Most of those people are gone. Most of those people are gone. And I want to go where they are. I want to go home. And God never ends the story. Never ends the story with bad news. Even when the, the children of Israel went into captivity for 70 years, what was the good news? What was the hope? The hope was at the end of this, you're going to come home. You're going to rebuild. And not only are you going to rebuild, you're not going to rebuild with your own money. You're going to rebuild with Persian funds. And what's so sad is that the devil has deceived so many into thinking that the Jerusalem in Israel is where we're all going to end up. That's not the Jerusalem listed in the book of Revelation. That's not where God dwells. He dwells in the Jerusalem from above. And you see that beautiful description. And when you got that wedding, there's things I like to go to. I like to go to weddings. I like to especially officiate because I can kind of rub it in on the people that I'm officiating, you know, and have a good time. Because I think weddings should be celebrations. But I've been to weddings when some of them were like funerals. <clears throat> And you read that beautiful description of how it will be perfect. No more crying. No more sighing. No sickness. No sorrow. No death. But then you still read of hope. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean hope? I thought that was the hope. Well, it is. But you read verse 17 of Revelation 22. The bride, that's the church, and the spirit say, come. And so what is God still requiring us to do today? Oh, I know there are members of the church that even make fun of this, but it's still biblical. You got to hear the word. You can't have faith without the word of God. Romans 10, 17. You got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, John 8, 24. 
You've got to repent of your sins, Acts 2.38. You got to change your mind about sin. And it's so simple that sometimes the devil goes, it can't be that easy. You know how many people I've talked to over the years that, and I know I'm not that old, but how, how many people I've talked to and they'll go, it can't be that easy, preach. It is. Because if you confess your sins and confess his name before men, what has he promised in Matthew 10, 32 and 33? If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And if he's the truth and the way and the life, you want him to confess you before the Father. And then be buried with him in baptism. 1 Peter 3.21 tells us baptism saves us. Colossians 2.11 and 12, Romans 6, 3 and 4 tells us proper biblical baptism is burial but you don't stay in that water. First guy I baptized here, he 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 and I had this joke. Man, life, Dwayne will drown you. He'll drown you. He'll leave you in that water if you... And then his daughter got baptized, and the first thing she said to her dad whenever daughter got baptized is, you lied about Dwayne. He didn't leave me in that water. See, the water really has nothing to do with it. The person baptizing has nothing to do with it, really. It's the obedience to God. And see, the devil knows that. And so then he turns around and he makes sure this way. Ah, you don't have to do that. You see, if you try to do that, if you try to remain faithful, oh, don't, don't, don't quote Revelation 2.10, Dwayne, be faithful to death and I'll give you the crown of life. You see, you're trying to earn salvation. No. No. I'm responding to what God has already done. I'm striving to do what God has already set for me. I, I think back to when the kids were very, very small, especially my daughter. And we would laugh. And on my phone, I have a picture of my dad holding my daughter at the babysitter's house. And I used to tell people, and from time to time, I'd tell them, hey, we can't get in that house without those grandkids. We're not Dwayne and Adele. We're Brianne and Christopher's parents. And I almost cried when I saw that picture. And the only reason I almost cried was my dad said, you tell them that's right. You don't get in this house with those, without those grandkids. I don't remember all the miles. I don't remember all the stripes on the road. I don't remember the whole 10, 14 hours to get there. But I sure remember the getting there. We didn't have to worry about where she was. Christopher never got to meet his papa. Never had to worry about her. And the reason is... She was home. Guys, that's what I want for us. I want to go home. But you can't be going home if you're not in Jesus. You can't go home if you're not washed in his blood. And so the question before us this morning is, are you washed in his blood? Most of us, if not all of us, are. But there, are, there may be something that we can pray for you about this morning. As my friend Steve Ham in Northwest Oklahoma preached a couple of weeks ago, come over and over and over if that's what you need to do. Because I've never read in the scriptures where his arms are closed. But they will be one day. They will be one day. If we can serve you, let us know while we sing. <clears throat> Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you walking daily by the Savior's sight? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? On the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white, pure and white in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the man? mansion bright and be washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain glowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the cleansing blood of the Lamb? Spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Three, before we partake of the bread. Three. Three. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save and put it for the skies, to serve the present. Age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care as in thy sight to live. And, O oh, thy servant, Lord, prepare the strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. Assured if my, my trust betray, I shall forever die. And Father, we know that we have a responsibility, an ability, and a privilege to share the great news, the good news, with everybody. Father, when we consider <clears throat> what our sins cost, we appreciate John's account more. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And Father, we thank you that he has done that. And we get to tell everybody. Yet, Father, we find that many people don't like that note, or they don't want to accept that. Many people think they're cursed. They are cursed without one 
who hasn't been cursed on a tree. Thank you, Father. And we follow the example at this time in that great supper when Jesus took that bread, gave thanks and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In Jesus we pray, amen. Before we partake of the fruit of the vine, nine, <clears throat> nine. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. That covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand that covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns with his fullness divine i sing in my rapture oh glory to god for such a redeemer as mine he hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. <clears throat> And Father, we thank you for being a wonderful Savior. We thank you that Jesus was willing to become the ultimate Savior for us because he took our debt, our penalty, and became the divine sacrifice. Thank you that it is his blood which repurchased us, which purchased the church and will take us home because it will cleanse us and continually cleanse us. We thank you that Jesus gave us the example of having fruit of the vine. And to our minds, it is our Savior's blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Please bless us and may we do it in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
118. Sing the first and last stanza, 118. I'm going to ask John to dismiss us in prayer, please. 118, first and last stanza. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Man, thank y'all for being here this morning.